You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for April 21, 2023. This week, a recap of the European Heart Rhythm Association, including a big study on early versus delayed ablation of AFib, a report on the most devastating complication of AFib, and a potential crosswind for a major therapeutic fashion in electrophysiology. I want to first say thank you to the Portuguese Society of Cardiology for inviting me to speak at this excellent meeting for the second time. Now, it was impressive to see such robust discussion about the many gray areas in cardiology. I don't know if it's something about Portugal, but I felt a strong sense of critical appraisal. And I love that because you don't always get that same sense at some of the major uh, cardiology meetings. And as I've said many times, I talk into this mic every Friday and I never know who is out there. So it means so much to me to know that you listen, especially the younger people. I'd mentioned names, but if I did, I would surely leave some out. So thank you to all that came up to me and said hello. And thank you times 1000 to the leaders of the Portuguese Cardiac Society. And one last thing, and this is a note to all other cardiac societies. You should have a real sports event at your meeting. I had 30 minutes to get out of my suit during my last session for the Saturday evening 10K. Now, this was no 5K hard walk. It was a serious race, one that was attended by local running clubs, one that had prize money, and one that required proper training. So when I accepted my invitation a few months before, I knew it was time to get to the track to do repeat 400s. We are cardiologists, and we should embrace hard stuff. Okay, let's start with some notes from the European Heart Rhythm Meeting in Barcelona, which happened last week. The first is early versus delayed AFib ablation. Now, ERA held its annual meeting last week. This is an ingenious move that they made a few years ago. They moved the meeting up in time, and now it comes before HRS. This was a wise decision because the first meeting has the attention advantage. Now, ERA had a handful of studies to discuss. I did not go get to attend. Uh, I still have to work full time. Now, even though these are hard rhythm studies, many are relevant to clinical practice or to cl critical appraisal. And I will keep this podcast relevant to all non-electrophysiology people, so don't stop listening. The most important study, in my opinion, was a late-breaking trial from Melbourne and Adelaide called, wait, wait, the authors don't have an acronym. How is that possible? Anyways, the study is called The Impact of Early Versus Delayed AFib Ablation on Atrial Arrhythmia Recurrences. The European Heart Journal published this paper as open access at this point. This was a randomized trial of doing AFib ablation right away, that is, within one month, and that is right after a referral to a major EP center, or delaying the ablation for 12 months. John Kelman from Melbourne led the study. Now, this is an important idea. I'm drawn to it because one of the developing therapeutic fashions in the United States is this early ablation. There are even advocates for a metric called, get this, diagnosis to ablation type, DAT. Proponents have even published a meta-analysis of very weak observational study that finds a shorter DAT, diagnosis to ablation time, associates with lower rates of AF recurrence. Of course it does. There are also RCTs of early AF ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs. Professor Jason Andrade from UBC has led the strongest of these studies. It's called the Early AF Study, published in New England. 
Early AF found that in drug-naive, newly diagnosed patients, cryoballoon ablation reduces AFib episodes compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. And a follow-up of the early AF study found that cryoballoon ablation leads to less progression of PAF to persistent AFib. And I'll link to both those New England Journal papers. Of course, you know, my friends, in the big business of healthcare, early AFib ablation has a lot of tailwinds. Namely, all the stakeholders win financially, right? Doctors make oodles of money from AF ablation, hospitals and device companies as well. And always remember, even in cost-constrained systems, status comes faster to the proceduralist than those who manage patients with, say, risk factor modification and reassurance. And for sure, there are occasional patients who do better with rapid AF ablation. Consider, for instance, the patient with tons of PAF who then has long post-conversion pauses with near syncope. The faster we get rid of this person's uh, atrial fib, the faster he or she stops having syncope from the pauses and avoids a pacemaker. Another example of sooner rather than later AF ablation is the patient who has had multiple admissions for heart failure due to AFib with rapid ventricular response. It's best not to wait in these patients. But, but, in the vast majority of cases, as someone said in my private message group, quote, AFib is a slow motion disease. Unlike interventional and heart failure, heroes are door to ablation times should be long. Now, the benefits of going slow in AFib care is that often AFib gets better when you treat their patient's sleep apnea, reduce or eliminate their alcohol intake, lose weight, exercise regularly, and control their blood pressure. But, but I'm about to tell you a secret, an EP secret. You might want to stop running or slow down on a bike and listen. Get this, sometimes AFib goes away on its own. It happened to me my partner, and many patients. As I always say in AF care, give peace a chance. Okay, now to the study. Patients were referred to the eminent AF centers in Melbourne and Adelaide. They were evaluated, and some were randomized to an early AF ablation within a month. The other group was randomized to the delayed ablation at 12 months. During that year, the expert team maximized the medical therapy. The trial studied this early versus delayed ablation. The primary endpoint was AF recurrences in the 12 months after the ablation. 100 patients were randomized, mean age 59, and the results were null. There were no differences in AFib-free survival in either groups after the ablation. Waiting to do the ablation did not make the ablation less successful. Secondary outcomes such as AF burden or antiarrhythmic drug use after the ablation did not differ either. The authors concluded, quote, the results from the current study provide reassuring data that it is still feasible to maintain asymptomatic AF patients on antiarrhythmic drug therapy for at least 12 months without adversely impacting outcomes of subsequent ablation. Another take from this null result could be that it is unlikely that a waiting list of a year is problematic, or that you don't have to rush to the EP lab. There is time. So, you know, I loved the results of this study. But we always need to face our biases. And mine is clearly that in most patients with AF, the best approach is slow medicine. What's more, I have the bias of knowing John Kelman and Price Sanders, both personally and through their trainees. They have my highest respect as doctors, teachers, and scientists, like super high levels of respect. Yet, no matter, we have to be careful drawing conclusions from this trial. There were 48 patients in the early ablation, 41 patients in the delayed arm. That's not a lot. Now, you might wonder where they came up with these numbers. Here, you have to estimate what you think the results would be before the trial. If you estimate there's going to be a small difference between the groups, you need a lot of patients. However, if you estimate there's going to be a large difference between the treatment groups, you need fewer patients. Fewer patients is good, right? Because it's a less costly and usually easier trial. 
The authors estimated a success rate of 74% in the early group versus only 45% in the delayed group. So we say they powered their study to find a 30% difference in ablation efficacy based on a difference of only 11 months. And this was a superiority trial. Early had to be superior. Now, it's fair to say that pretrial estimates are nearly always optimistic like this. Very few trials are overpowered. But this is very, very, very optimistic. So this means low numbers of patients recruited and a much easier time for delayed ablation to look similar to early ablation. Now, I wonder if it would have been better as a non-inferiority trial, but that's another matter. Another limitation. I'm having trouble understanding how they recruited for this trial. I mean, these were symptomatic patients referred to very famous centers for ablation. The vast majority of these patients were already on antiarrhythmic drugs. They were randomized to having an ablation now or in 12 months, and that seems curious. So to help us know how to translate this data, it would have been helpful to know how many patients were screened and not randomized. I mean, all patients in any trial are special, but here it would be good to know how special these patients were. I suspect that these were fairly highly selected patients, but we don't know. Another problem, and it's in Table 1, Patient Characteristics, always look at Table 1. Here, there were substantially more patients with persistent AFib in the early ablation arm, 54% versus 37%. That biases against the early group. Now, there's nothing nefarious here. The baseline difference does not impugn the randomization process. It is simply a problem of low numbers, like getting seven heads and three tails of a 10 coin toss experiment. And my final take homes. This trial makes me think of our own HisSync trial of His bundle pacing versus CRT. HisSync was a self-funded trial. We had limited resources. We powered the trial for a big effect size, and in the end, we learned it was underpowered. We didn't really answer the question. This trial, I think, also is underpowered to make major conclusions. And this issue makes me think about the tension between doing trials in real life. I, there are two opposing ideas, and I'm not sure which is the right idea. Maybe you do, and you can let me know. Yes, I strongly believe we need far more trials. Equipoise and uncertainty is everywhere in medicine, and the only way to resolve it is with randomization. But, on the other hand, trials have to be constrained enough and big enough to give answers, lest there's no reason to do the trial. Of course, it's hard to know this beforehand. I suspect that the authors don't think much of the diagnosis to ablation metric. I don't either. EP, as a specialty, risks losing respect when we advocate for early procedures that benefit us financially. In most cases, a wait for AF ablation is okay because it gives us time for education, for risk factor management, and for nature to cure in some cases. There was no signal of harm for waiting in this trial, but if we are true to critical appraisal, I think we have to be careful leaning too hard on these results. My bias against early AF ablation as a therapeutic fashion remains skeptical. Okay, second study is called the Potter AF study of esophageal fistula post AF ablation. Now, the risk of catheter ablation of AFib is low, probably in the range of 1% overall, but the most feared complication is atrial esophageal fistula. This occurs late, usually after two to three weeks, usually due to thermal uh, lesions to the esophagus from burning in the posterior left atrial wall. Remember, the esophagus sits right behind the left atrium. Now, if a fistula occurs, it is fatal in the majority of cases, so thankfully it is rare. Now, pause there, slow down, and let's think. AF ablation can have a fatal complication. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Come on, Mandrola, any procedure, PCI, pacemaker, ICD, TAVI, can have fatal complications. But a atrial esophageal fistula is different. It's different because the vast majority of AF ablation is electively done for improvement of quality of life. We don't have strong data that AF ablation reduces hard clinical outcomes. Remember, Cabana was null. Castle AF enrolled 1 in 10 patients that were screened. Also, always remember 
we're doing millions of AF ablations in the name of improving quality of life, and we have zero sham controlled studies. So any patient that dies from an atrial esophageal fistula is one who would have been alive had they taken a conservative approach to their AFib. Mathematician and author Nassim Taleb talks often about tail risks. Atrial esophageal fistula is a tail risk. It's a rare complication, but it has catastrophic consequences. The European Heart Journal published a Potter AF study which set out to evaluate the incidence management and outcomes of a fistula after catheter ablation. It was led by Roland Tills, an energetic man whom I met when I visited Hamburg many years ago. Dr. Tills led the study along with global colleagues. Now, Tills is now at the University of Lubeck, and he sent out a survey to major EP centers. This allowed him to create a registry. Remember, science tells us what we can do, trials tell us what we should do, and registries tell us what we are doing. So registries are important. Potter AF is huge. 214 of 609 invited centers sent in data. This was from 35 countries on five continents and more than 500,000 ablation procedures. Two-thirds of the procedures were RF, one-third cryo-balloon. A total of 138 patients from 78 centers had AE fistula, the percent overall 0.025%. The incidence of uh, AE fistula with RF was 0.0. 0.38, while for cryobalone, it was 0.0015%, so much, much more common with RF ablation. The median time of presentation of this problem was 18 days. However, one AE fistula occurred on day two, and this one had a maximum of uh, watts of only 25 watts on the posterior wall. So the main symptoms of atrial esophageal fistula is actually fever, chest pain or swallowing next, neurosymptoms next. The main diagnostic tool is a chest CT, and the outcomes are terrible. 65% of patients who had AE fistula died, 10% had major sequelae, so three in four patients do terrible with this. The mortality following surgical or endoscopic treatment was significantly lower as compared to conservative management. The odds ratio was 7.4x, so patients who had intervention were much more likely to do better. Now, the learning points for everyone. To any non-EP clinicians listening, if your patient is two to six weeks after AF ablation, be alert to the possibility of a fistula. I've heard of cases in which patients traveled to a different city after AF ablation and got delayed treatment because the clinician seeing them were not aware of it. Be aware of a fistula. For EP physicians, I'd recommend having conversation with your partners, emergency medicine, surgical GI, radiology colleagues to increase awareness. If a patient with AE fistula presents on a Friday night and you aren't around, it, you want other doctors to know the deal. All right, now my comments on the Potter AF study. Three comments. This is a nice effort on the part of Professor Tills and his team. The first issue is the undercount. I strongly suspect that this is a substantial underestimate. A, it's a voluntary survey. About two-thirds of the centers did not participate. B, the authors only invited major centers, and it's likely that AE fistula occurs as commonly or perhaps more commonly at small, less experienced centers that Dr. Tills didn't send this registry form to. All right, the next issue is prevention. And right away, you know it will be hard to study preventive efforts. And I hope you understand why this is. Because it's such a rare event. It's exactly why ECG screening in athletes to prevent sudden death during sports is so problematic. Whenever you have rare events, it's hard to study and it's hard to modify those. And there are actually some studies looking at esophageal temperature monitoring. Here, two RCT, RCTs of esophageal temperature monitoring had to resort to using the surrogate marker of an esophageal lesion seen on endoscopy after the procedure. That's a problem because esophageal lesions on procedures are just surrogates for an AE fistula. Anyways, both these trials have been null. In other words, neither showed that esophageal monitoring reduced lesions. Yet, 
esophageal management is a big business. Some of the probes that we use are quite expensive and come with the tents marketing. I'll link to both those studies. The way I try to prevent a fistula is to use very short duration burns on the posterior wall. I move around to avoid heat stacking. So if you make one burn in one place, then you make another burn far away from the esophagus. Uh, I watch the electrogram to see terminal ST elevation and, and diminution of the electrogram. Perhaps that's a sign of transmurality. And the reason I do that is because this may come about in two to three seconds, and then there is no reason to continue a burn for five or 10 seconds. Now, I have another preventive technique that I will discuss in the next and final section on this study. The third issue I want to talk about with this study is risk. Risk. I think about risk in different ways when it comes to atrial esophageal fistula. Yes, on an individual basis for patients, the risk of dying or being rendered severely neurologically impaired is very, very low. But it's not zero, and it does not appear that being experienced or using temperature probes alters the risk very much. Therefore, atrial esophageal fistula after ablation is stochastic. It's a chance event. And that notion leads me to think of the risk to doctors and centers. If atrial esophageal fistula is a minimally modifiable probabilistic event and you do enough procedures, it will likely come to you. A recent consensus document on AF ablation Authors wrote that half the, half the doctors in that consensus document had had an atrial esophageal fistula at their center. That means, probabilistically, that eventually an EP doctor is likely to kill a patient with AF ablation. And these are often young people having preference sensitive procedures. So, the regret principle is one of the main reasons I am conservative with AF ablation. In the event of a serious complication, will I have looked back and felt regret that this patient could have been managed conservatively? Given time and enough en energy managing risk factors, could this patient have avoided a procedure? Complications will always occur, and when they do, you will feel horrible. But you'll feel even more horrible if the indications for the procedure were soft and there was a possibility of managing without the procedure. So one way to prevent atrial esophageal fistula is to minimize the number of AF ablations you do, and you do them for only the best reasons. The older I get, the more AF procedures I do, the more I worry about atrial esophageal fistula. All right, final topic is about another therapeutic fashion that faced crosswinds from the studies at European Heart Rhythm Association. As regular listeners know, AF ablation is A, becoming a major money-making procedure. Nearly every week, I get a Google alert saying uh, from some business how big the AF ablation market is. Uh, B, success rates aren't much better than that described in Bordeaux more than two decades ago. And C, instead of trying to better understand the pathophysiology of AF, the EP community seems focused on making AF ablation faster so we can do more of these lucrative procedures. The latest popular fashion is something called high-power short-duration RF delivery. Now, recall that in pulmonary vein isolation, we're using dots, RF lesions, to create lines of block. Think about electric fences, if you will, around the pulmonary veins. Traditionally, each dot requires about 10 to 30 seconds of RF energy. Now, the potential advantage of increasing the power, more watts, is that you can shorten the time of ablation to seconds. Faster ablation means more ablation, and more ablation means more dollars. Now, high power, short duration proponents don't just focus on doing faster ablations, they also emphasize safety. Physics explains why. When you put watts through a catheter tip on a uh, myocardium, you cause heating. Heating occurs in two ways, resistive and conductive. Resistive heating creates a heat sink and moves passively to deeper phases through the muscle. Conductive heating is time-dependent and a direct result of current applied. So, in standard, longer-duration burns, conductive heating makes for a deeper lesion. In shorter-duration burns, there is more resistive heating and less conductive heating so that the burn is wider but not so deep. And, of course, all this comes from basic science. In other words, 
the less deep lesions of high power short duration should reduce non-cardiac thermal damage like esophageal injury. And there have been a slew of small, methodologically weak studies that have led key opinion leaders to promote high power short duration. It's becoming a therapeutic fashion. Now, I've never been sold on it. I use standard power and short duration so as to minimize the risk of esophageal ener energy. At the European Heart Rhythm Association, a group of Spanish investigators put high power short duration to the proper test, and that is randomization. About 150 patients in each group, high power short duration versus conventional. Primary endpoint was esophageal lesions, AF efficacy, and total RF time. Now, the results are preliminary and are not yet published, but in terms of the ease of doing PVI, there was no difference. Though first pass PVI, a marker of good PVI, was actually a bit worse with high power short duration. Procedure times, overall no difference, but there was less PVI time in the high power short duration group. AF recurrences at 12 months, no difference. Esophageal lesions, 3.6% versus 2.7%. Essentially, no difference. However, here's the take-home point. Complications, ouch. Four-stroke TIA systemic embolisms versus zero. My friends, that is a lot of strokes in just 144 patients. Stroke rates should be near zero with AF ablation. PowerFast investigators also presented an MRI substudy. About half the study subjects in that study got brain RMIs after the ablation. 59% in the high power short duration group had brain ischemic lesions, so-called white spots on MRI, versus only 25% in the low power lower, longer duration. That was highly significant. The odds ratio was 5x more likely to have brain lesions in the high power short duration arm. Now, neither of these sobering reports have been published, so let's not make too many big conclusions. Also, high power short duration comes in many different varieties. This was very high power, 70 watts, for a pretty long time, 9 to 10 seconds. Critics of this study might suggest that the power was too high and it was applied for too long. That's fair, but I would counter that if you believe your HPSD, high power short duration algorithm, is safer or better, the only way to answer it is exactly how this group led by Professor Marino did it, with proper randomization. Single center, non-random comparisons or physics studies don't cut it. So I am skeptical about high power, short duration, more strokes and more brain lesions and power fast makes me even more skeptical. What shocks me is how fast this high power, short duration fashion started and how persistent it is. I've got a new lecture about therapeutic fashions. These are interesting ph phenomena, so stand by. I'll talk more about that in coming podcast. So that's it for this week. I went a little bit longer because there was so much exciting news in my field of atrial fibrillation and electrophysiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to get us, give us a rating. Write us a one or two sentence review. These things go a long way to helping others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.